Hey Chemistry, Mrs. KJ here going over 3.07 nonmetals. As always, have your periodic table and notes ready. Where are the nonmetals? Well, you should be able to look at this and say, I know below hydrogen I have what group? Alkali metals. My next group, group two, is called alkaline earth metals. I have my messy middle transition metals. And right here, along these two rows, which are called the what? Inner transition metals, or if you said lanthanide and actinide series, that's okay. And again, this blue area, we're just counting as part of the metals. They are core metals. But the stair step of elements are called the what? Metalloids, oid, because they are kind of like metals and kind of like nonmetals. Aha, there we go. Here are our nonmetals, except for which one? Hydrogen. So why is hydrogen over here if it's a nonmetal? Why is it over here by the ones that it is like? Well, it's in group one, so that tells us it has what? One valence or outer electron, and it reacts similar to the alkali metals, so therefore it is put over here. So the nonmetals are on the right side except hydrogen. Why is it in group 1A? It has one valence electron. Valence electron meaning what? Outer electron or one electron in the outermost four orbital. Metals are blank except mercury is a blank. So we're going to talk about the states of matter. And so we have solid, liquid, and gas. Metals are what? They are solid. You know that. They're solid except for mercury, which is a liquid. It's not going to be on the test, but just want to remind you that mercury is toxic. Nonmetals have some of each phase. Bromine is a liquid at room temperature. So bromine and mercury are the only two elements that are liquid at room temperature. And what about the rest of them? So bromine is a liquid at room temperature, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, and the noble gases are what? Are they solid, liquid, or gas? And if you're thinking, well, you kind of took away the diagram, this is KJ. I know I did, but you should know this. You should know, not this one, bromine, that's fine. You don't have to have that memorized. It's not on the quiz either. But these are what? Think about it. Oxygen is a gas, and noble gases, it's part of the word. Okay, so... The ones that they have in yellow are gases, like the oxygen gas that you breathe in. And then, of course, there are some that are solid, like carbon, phosphorus, sulfur, selenium, iodine. Chlorine is a yellow poison gas. The other gases are colorless and odorless, but can still be dangerous. For example, oxygen is very flammable, and radon can seep into a basement and kill everyone inside. There's actually a lot of areas of radon in Minnesota. So if you have never heard of radon testing, it's something to please ask your parent or guardian about. Um, they can use the ventilation system to get the radon out of your basement, but it can kill people. So it is very dangerous. Um, fixing it, thank goodness. It's not like you have to demolish your house or sell your house. I mean, it can be $1,000, which, don't get me wrong, is a lot of money, but it's not like you have to move. So that's a good thing. So make sure that your house has been checked for radon gas. So even though a lot of these nonmetal gases are bad, poisonous, dangerous, ironically, we need most of the nonmetals for life and survival. We are made of chomps. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So even though chlorine is a poisonous gas, you consume chlorine in what? Probably every day. NaCl, which is table salt. So we already talked about the halogens, but let's review. The halogens are group number what? Seven. So how many valence electrons? Group seven means there are seven outer electrons or seven valence electrons in the outermost four orbital. And so because it has seven valence electrons, what is it going to do to get a full outer shell? It is going to gain one electron. After it gains an electron, it has a charge of what? 
So let's do an example. Chlorine is number 17. It starts with 17 protons, 17 electrons. 17 minus 17 is 0. It starts out neutral. But if I gained an electron, now I have 17 protons minus 18 electrons. And what is my charge? Negative 1. Remember, when we gain electrons, we become more negative. Think of them as bad. When you get more bad things, you feel more negative. So how reactive are our halogens and why? They are crazy reactive because they only want one more electron. They just need that one, one more. Oh, please, please, pretty please, gimme, gimme, gimme. Group eight are the what? That already have a what and are stable. So how reactive are they? So the name for group eight, they are the noble gases. They already have a what? Full outer shell and are stable. So how reactive are they? Not at all. They are the noble gases who look down. Noble gases look down on the peasant atoms. They don't need to react together. All right. So just a reminder, um, differences between metals and nonmetals. Metals are shiny. Nonmetals are dull. Metals are solid except mercury at room temperature. Nonmetals can be all of them. Density. Metals are very heavy. They're very dense. Nonmetals are very light. Think about oxygen. Yeah, you're touching it all the time. It's pretty light. You don't even notice it. Metals are strong. Nonmetals are weak. Metals are malleable, so they bend without breaking. Nonmetals are brittle. They break or shatter when they are hammered. Metals are good conductors of heat and electricity. Nonmetals are not. In fact, they are insulators. Except for graphite, you don't have to remember that. Magnetic metals. Some metals are magnetic but no nonmetals are magnetic. If you hit them, metals make a ringing sound like a bell or chimes. Nonmetals make a dull sound. Metals are ductile, meaning you can pull them into wires. Nonmetals are not. So lastly, I did want to talk a little bit more about radon, which is a nonmetal gas. Um, this is from the Minnesota Department of Health. The Minnesota Department of Health provides information on radon and how to protect your family's health. And it recommends that every home be tested. Now, radon's different than other materials. For example, if you have bad well water, so if you live out in the country and you don't have city water, if you have a bad well, you know, there's a chance that other people nearby have a bad well. Radon can be different. Your neighbor can be tested and your neighbor's house has no radon and your house can have radon. Okay, it can make that much of a difference. It has to do with the rocks and all that underneath where the homes are, but one neighbor can have it, one neighbor cannot. So that's why every home should be tested. Radon is a colorless, odorless, radioactive gas. That means it radioactively decays. That seeps up from the earth. When inhaled, it gives off radioactive particles that can damage the cells that line the lungs. Long-term exposure to radon can lead to lung cancer. In fact, over 21,000 lung cancer deaths in the U.S. each year are from radon. So it's very serious in Minnesota. Minnesota actually has high populations of it. It comes from the soil. Radon is produced from the natural decay of uranium. Yeah, like uranium bombs. That's how dangerous we're talking about this radon stuff. No, it's not going to blow up. It's just radioactive, meaning that it can mess with your DNA when it gets inside of you. Radon is produced from the natural decay of uranium that is found in nearly all soils. Uranium breaks down into radium. As radium disintegrates, it turns into radioactive gas called radon. As a gas, radon moves up through the soil and into the air you breathe. How does radon enter your home? Since radon is produced from soil, it is present nearly everywhere. Because soil is porous, radon gas is able to move up through the dirt and rocks and into the air we breathe. If allowed to accumulate, Radon becomes a health concern. The two components that affect how much radon will accumulate in a home are pathways and air pressure. That's part of why you can have it and your neighbor doesn't, or your neighbor has radon problems and you don't. So pathways are routes the gas uses to enter your home and found anywhere there's an opening between the home and the soil. Air pressure between your home's interior and exterior soil is what helps draws radon gas into the home via pathways. Kind of like when you suck up a drink out of a straw, that's a change in pressure. And that change in pressure 
can cause the radon to basically be sucked up into your house like through a straw. So I want to talk specifically about Minnesota. How serious a problem is radon in Minnesota? High radon exists in every state in the United States. In Minnesota, two in five homes has radon levels that possess a significant health risk. And nearly 80% of counties are rated high radon zones. Okay, this is a big, big deal in Minnesota. Minnesota's geology produces an ongoing supply of radon. And Minnesota's climate affects how our homes are built and operate. So it's a two-fold issue. So air pressure. Minnesota homes commonly operate under a negative air pressure, especially during the heating season, which, as you know, if you've lived in Minnesota your whole life, sometimes, I swear, we're heating our house from like the end of September until the beginning of June, right? What this means is that the air pressure inside your home is typically lower than the surrounding air and soil, and this creates a vacuum. Yeah, like a vacuum cleaner, like when you suck on a straw, and it pulls that soil gases such as radon into the home via pathways. Even if the ground around the home is frozen or soaked by rain, the gravel and disturbed ground underneath the house remains warm and permeable, meaning it can go through, attracting radar and gas from the surrounding soil. So other issues that affect our air pressure, stack effect. As warm air rises to the upper portions of a home, it is displaced by cooler, denser outside air, some of that displaced air comes from the soil. Downwind effect. Strong winds can create a vacuum as they blow over the top of the home. And the vacuum effect. Combustion appliances like furnaces, hot water heaters, and fireplaces, as well as exhaust fans and vents, can remove a considerable amount of air from a home. When air is exhausted or taken out, outside air enters the home to replace some of it. Some of this replacement air comes from the underlying soil. So, what happens after radon gets into a home? Radon levels are often highest at the entry point, so typically in the lower part of the building or the basement, but it moves. It moves upward, and you probably have air conditioning, and that's distributing it everywhere in your home. So, greater dilution and less house vacuum effect occur when the house is more open to the outdoors, which is nice when we can have our windows open, which is for like what? Two months out of the year sometimes? <laughs> I know I'm exaggerating. Sometimes we have really nice summers. But this generally results in lower indoor radon levels in summer compared to winter. All right, three ways to protect yourself. Test your home. Obtain a test kit. Reduce your exposure is number two. So reduce radon gas by taking action to reduce radon entry into your home and protect your loved ones. Tell your family and friends to test so they are not exposed to a deadly gas in their homes. This is so important. Extra credit. I want you to ask your parent or guardian or landlord or whoever. I want to know if your home where you are living right now has been tested for radon gas. And if you wouldn't mind sharing, I'd like to know the results because I'd like to actually hear from some people who have dealt with going through fixing the radon levels. Um, but yeah, email me either way and let me know if your house has been tested for radon gas because this is a big deal. All right. That's all I have for this section. And again, you can just Google Minnesota Department of Health, radon test kits. They're super easy to do. Um, but yeah, that's it. Okay, talk to you later.